The measure of intelligence is the ability to change. Hi everyone, Dr. Clark here again. And for this lecture, we're going to talk about lipids. Um, you guys might know lipids by a different name, and that is fats. But not all lipids are fats. All fats are lipids, but not all lipids are fats. And we'll cover this here in a little bit. So when you hear the term fat or fats, you might think of something like this, you know, associated with, you know, pizza and french fries and hamburgers and hot dogs and other things. Um, things that are really potentially high in carbohydrates, high in protein, high in calories. Right. Now, do they have fats? Of course, um, they do have fats. Some saturated, some unsaturated fats. We'll cover that. Okay. You might also think about something like this. You might think about oil and water um, and that being kind of an association between fats and a, a water source or something like that. But most likely you're not thinking about this. Right? And what I want you to think about in this course is, yes, I want you to think about lipids as a energy storage molecule. I want you to think about the association between lipids and water. But I also want you to think about lipids in the formation of membranes. Because without lipids, we don't have cells. Because all of our cell membranes are made out of phospholipids. And these phospholipids, in our case, form something like this called a phospholipid bilayer. So there's two layers that, that form our cell membranes. The very first cells on the planet, the very first cells to evolve, most likely were in this form, a mysocell. All right, they weren't a double layer, but a single layer that encapsulated probably some information carrying molecule like RNA. We believe RNA came before DNA. We might get into some discussions about the evolution of simple life as we progress into evolution. The other thing that we know is that there are certain situations like when we're developing as a young um, that our blastomers are, are the beginning of life. This situation occurs, a liposome. But I want you to think about lipids more than just fats, okay? So that's kind of the key around lipids is they're more than just fats. So lipids are fats, like I said before, but there are other molecules that are not soluble in water. We discussed this before. What makes something not soluble in water? Well, that molecule is going to need to be nonpolar. That molecule is not going to have a polar side. So that's a good start. If you're nonpolar, you're likely not going to be able to dissolve in water at initially, okay? But sometimes we can add certain things to that substance, that nonpolar substance that might break it or might make it polar. And then it has the ability to dissolve at least partially in water. So again, lipids are nonpolar molecules. That's what makes them not dissolve in water and have the property of being hydrophobic right, or water repelling. Polar molecules are hydrophilic, sometimes called water loving, but they dissolve in water. And so, like I said, all fats are lipids, but not all lipids are fats because there are quite a few different types of lipids. Of course, you have fats, right? and for a more technical term, these fats are called typically glycerides. 
And so they will have some form um, and it's based on how many glycerides you are packing together uh, um, or how much fatty acid is is um, building that glyceride. So you might have a monoglyceride, which is a single glyceride, a di, which is two, a tri, which is three. We'll cover this here in a second. Okay? Oils, okay, natural and synthetic oils, okay, they're both considered lipid. Steroids, rubber, wax, pigments, okay, all of these things are, you know, I shouldn't say all of them, but the majority of them we have synthetic. So things that have been created in chemical labs, put together. And then there's natural. There's natural steroids. There's natural rubber. There's natural waxes, natural pigments. Okay, so there's a lot of natural lipids that have these properties. And then we make synthetic ones because it's easier. Um, and you can mass produce them versus you know, taking pigments from flowers and getting your pigments that way, you can just mass produce the pigment um, without cutting a bunch of flowers up. Okay, but the pigment itself is a lipid. Okay? So it is a nonpolar molecule. Now, here's this, I guess this concept that often individuals put together when talking about fats or talking about lipids and that is fats I mean it, it's been said many times fats are bad okay fats are you know cause health problems etc and of course that that's absolutely true in some situations that a huge buildup of fat can cause health issues absolutely but Fats are a evolutionary adaptation for nearly every single organism. And this is kind of how organisms store energy. They store it as fats. And so when we take in food like glucose or proteins, or even fats or some versions of nucleic acids if we don't utilize all the energy that comes from that molecule we'll store it as fat this is i mean it's a great amazing evolutionary adaption for most organisms because energy in most situations is limited so if energy is limited, you might go out one day and be able to take in 15, 20,000 calories in one day. If energy is limited, the next day you're probably not going to be able to do that. And the next day maybe you're not going to be able to do that. And the next day maybe you're not going to be able to do that. Maybe you won't even get, maybe you won't even get 100 calories or 200 calories. So you use the energy from that initial pot of energy, that big exploration, you found food, you found an apple tree, you ate all the apples, whatever it might have been, and you just load yourself with energy. That energy is converted into fat, and then you can utilize that energy at a later date when food is scarce evolutionarily speaking this is this is a great great evolutionary adaptation the problem is in human culture in human societies that are developed countries often energy is not limited often energy is nearly free you can go out and get 2,000 calories every day. Even if you have no money, you can get 2,000 calories every single day in most developed countries. Energy is not limited. 
because energy is not limited, those developed countries have issues with obesity, issues with fat-related diseases, fat-related health problems, because the energy is no longer limited. So individuals, because it's in our innate genetic control, we eat constantly. Yes, it's a hard habit to break, but it's, it's genetic. A portion of it is genetic that you should eat when the food is available because you evolved as an, a creature to do that. Now, can you break that? Of course. Not all genetically controlled things doesn't, don't have, you know, and also a learned portion to it. Okay, but innately, genetically, you are initially going to do that. Right? All organisms will do that. Right? Every organism, every animal has the ability to overconsume. Overconsume, build up massive fat storages, right? and if it's a constant, if the food's constantly available, that organism is going to become obese and have health issues because genetically that's what we evolved as a creature that never had free food at all times a creature that needed to search out food and go long periods of time where you're not eating okay, where you're just living off your fat storage okay. so excess glucose excess proteins excess lipids that's going to go into long-term storage, and fats are great for long-term energy storage. Now, fats themselves are built of two monomers, okay? fatty acid, what are often called fatty acid tails, and glycerol heads or glycerol backbones. Okay, we'll, we'll look at this here in a second. Fatty acid is where a lot of that energy comes in. This is where that energy, long-term energy storage portion of the molecule is because a fatty acid is what we call a chain of hydrocarbons or a chain of carbon to hydrogen. We talked about this before. Where you see a carbon, carbon can bind to four things sometimes, okay? but it needs four electrons. So maybe it'll bind to itself, creating a chain of carbons. But then off that carbon, you're going to have multiple hydrogens. Right? The more bonds you have, the more bonds you can break, the more energy you will get. So it's a great long-term storage of energy. In the end of these hydrocarbons, they'll often have some kind of carboxyl group or something with a carboxyl group. And it depends, obviously, on the lipid. We'll discuss some of the lipids and some of the varieties of lipids, but just keep that in mind. The monomers are the fatty acids and glycerols. Okay? The lipid or the fat is the polymer. So here you can see probably the most common fat at least for energetic storage right, or what we often associate with you know fat that you would have in your body and that is triglycerides okay there are diglycerides and monoglycerides also triglycerides are associated with these fatty acid tails it's telling you how many fatty acid tails there are in this case, three. You can see here attached to each one of those tails is going to be a glycerol molecule. Okay? So sometimes people call these glycerol heads. Sometimes people call these glycerol backbones. Okay? Either way, the glycerol is the cap on one end of the fatty acid. But you can see here, a bunch of carbons hydrogens off of each one of those carbons that is stored energy you cleave these hydrogens off and you get energy energy that allows you to do work we'll come back and look at the role that 
these molecules play in things like the Krebs cycle or cellular respiration. Now, there is obviously different types of fats which, and lipids, which we just discussed, but those lipids and fats will have certain chemical properties based on their chemical structure. So based on how many carbons or how long your hydrocarbon chain is. Is it a four hydrocarbon chain? Is it an eight carbon hydrocarbon chain? Is it a 16 hydrocarbon chain? Okay, so that will determine, you know, the stability, the long-term storage of that energy. The shorter the chain, the easier it is to break down, manipulate, but also the less energy that that chain or that molecule is going to have. So not only does the length of the chain make a difference, also what is bound in the chain makes a difference. For example, if you have the maximum number of hydrogens in your carbon chain, in your fatty acid tail, if you have the maximum amount of hydrogens attached, okay, so bonded to the carbons, that fat is considered saturated. So you can think of saturation means, you know, it's, it's got all that it can have, all that it can hold. If you saturate a sponge with water, it's, you know, it's completely full. Any more water in the, in the water is going to be leaking out of it. Okay, same thing here. Saturated fats are saturated with hydrogen. Unsaturated fats are going to have fewer than the maximum attached hydrogens. Okay. So unsaturated have fewer than the maximum hydrogens and saturated have the maximum hydrogens. So let's look at an example of this. So here you can see saturated fats. Okay, there's that carbon chain. Okay, this is a triglyceride, three fatty acid tails, okay, carbons, hydrogens bound to every one of those carbons. It is maxed, it's maxed out, okay? it's saturated. Well, one of the key components to a saturated fat is at room temperature, it's going to be a solid. So it's going to be a solid. One of the reasons why it's solid and the main reason why it's solid is these fatty acid tails, there's no kink in them. There's no bends in them so they can lay flat and you can pack them together in tight packs and, and therefore you can pack that fat together and it will solidify. Now you can obviously warm this up and start breaking these bonds. When you do that, it turns into a liquid. When you start breaking up and removing some of these hydrogens, it starts to liquidify. Now, unsaturated fats, here you can see an example of unsaturated fat. You see these kinks that are occurring in these fatty acid tails. Those kinks represent where carbon is bound to itself. So carbon binds to itself forming a double bond between carbon and you don't have the maximum number of hydrogens. At room temperature, these guys are liquids. All right, so oils and things like that are unsaturated fats. Again, the premise here is that when you have those double bonds and you're not, you don't have the maximum hydrogens, you can't lay the fatty acid tails here, you can't lay them flat. Okay, so there's no, there's no flattening them out like this. There's gonna be kinks. That allows for space to form between the molecules and they take up more space and therefore are liquid at room temperature. The other great component of this or unique component of this is our cell membranes are like this, except for they're not a triglyceride, okay? They have two fatty acid tails, so they're a phospholipid um, 
but with two fatty acids, not three fatty acid tails. But they do have kinks. They do have this double bonded carbon. Well, the nice thing about that is it allows for that membrane to not be smashed together in, as a saturated fat, but to have kind of openings or have uh, pockets of movement so your membranes can flex. This is a very, you know, advantageous adaptation that evolved. That flexibility in your membranes allows for your membranes to grow. So if you take in a bunch of water, your membranes will expand. If you lose a bunch of water, your membranes will shrink. If you're talking about things like red blood cells and white blood cells that by, might be moving from veins to arteries into capillaries, okay, and they're needing to shrink down to fit in to regions, okay, they have that flexibility. They can shrink. They can, you know, move. That membrane can shrink and re-expand. And that's one of the unique properties of cell membranes or our cells is that they're built of these unsaturated fatty acid tails. Okay, so back to membranes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about lipid membranes. We'll talk about cell membranes. Um, when we, we're going to talk a little bit about cells, not, not diving in too deep, but I want you to know, you know some pieces of the cell because when we start talking about genetics, you need to know where information is stored, how does it get copied, that kind of stuff, like what are ribosomes and, and other things that occur in the cell. So we need to talk a little bit about that, but we'll come back and talk a little more about lipid membranes. Again, like I said, our membranes are made of phospholipids. Right, you can see them here. You can see they have kind of a phosphate head and a fatty acid tail. Well, the head itself is hydrophilic. The head itself can react with water. But the tails are hydrophobic. So the tails face each other and the heads face away from the middle of where those tails are at. This is a unique property um, and allows for a lot of control. So inside the cell, because of this membrane, because of this relationship of polar and nonpolar molecule, things inside the cell don't leak out. Things outside of the cell don't leak in. So the cell controls the movement of stuff across the membrane. How is that controlled? Well, you have some proteins. We talked about this when we were talking about proteins. You have what we call transmembrane proteins, or proteins that move all the way through the bilayer. They can allow for things to flow freely. They can be subjected to just allowing one thing to come in. In some cases, they only allow things to migrate through the membrane by utilizing energy, by burning energy. Okay. You can also see a little bit of saturated fat inside this membrane. This is cholesterol. Cholesterol is important for our membranes. Cholesterol is a saturated fat, so it's more rigid. But that rigidity is needed for our membrane because like I said before, our membrane is mainly unsaturated fat, which allows for it to move and, and be manipulated. But you also need a little bit of rigidity inside that membrane so it just doesn't move too much. So it has that capability to resist collapsing on itself, to resist expanding too far. And that's where that cholesterol comes in or that saturated fat comes in. Okay, so again, cholesterol is embedded within the membrane. Now, you get too much cholesterol in your membranes, 
what happens? They become too rigid. They now no longer have the ability to flex. So if you have too much cholesterol, you'll often have poor blood flow in certain regions. Okay? You're just not, the blood cells are not able to reach, efficiently reach parts of your body. You can also have buildup, like plaque buildup and things like that, where now because your blood cells are not able to compress to get around blockages, they'll build up and they get like a, a roadblock or a traffic jam, they get stuck behind a little blockage and that causes heart attacks or strokes and things like that. Okay, so we'll come back and we'll talk about some of this because with everything that we've talked about, all the biomolecules that we've talked about, whether we're talking about it from a dietary standpoint or we're talking about it from you know building blocks of life kind of standpoint, everything that we talk about from a dietary standpoint, everything's perfectly good for you in moderation. If you consume too much of any biomolecule, it can cause complications. Okay? It can overwork your kidneys if you're eating too many proteins. Okay? If you eat too many carbohydrates, okay? which are you know excellent energy storage molecules and they have high amounts of energy, you're just going to store it as fats. You eat too many fats, right? you're going to create a lot of either fat or you're going to create a, lo a lot of acid in your system. Same thing with proteins. The more proteins you eat, the more acidic your system gets because meat is very acidic when it's broken down. It creates a lot of free hydrogen ions. So again, moderation. If you eat a ton of nucleic acids, okay, you're going to build up a lot of nitrogen. You, you might build up you know, other health issues. You're going to overwork your liver, overwork your kidney. So when we talk about these biomolecules and dietary, again, moderation is key. Okay? Overindulgence of anything can be problematic. Now, when we talk about it from building blocks of life, it's kind of the similar process. A little bit of cholesterol inside your cells, awesome, perfect. Okay. A huge amount, not good. Okay. Too many uh, chemicals in a biochemical pathway, a buildup of excess chemicals in a biochemical pathway, can cause basically a short circuit of your biochemical pathways. We'll look at this as we progress. Okay, but moderation, either from the dietary standpoint, from biological, you know, structure standpoint, moderation is needed, and you have control systems to deal with that. Okay? We have control systems in place. We don't just continuously make proteins that are not needed. Okay, we have ways to stop the construction of proteins. We'll come back to this and look at this at future lectures. Okay? So next time, I think we'll probably touch just a little bit on cells. And then we'll progress from cells to start talking about how energy flows through a system. And then um, start getting into those systems that are pertinent or important to today's biology. Okay. Next time.